Thanks for the kind introduction. Our industry has a big job ahead, shifting negative perceptions about seniors' communities and aged care. Last year and ongoing, it was the Royal Commission that laid bare systemic failures and kicked off broader conversations about underlying problems in our society, like ageism and undervaluing care professions. This year, it's been the catastrophic impact of COVID-19 on our sector, the heartbreaking situations residents, staff and families are still navigating in prolonged lockdowns, and public debate about underlying political, social and economic contributors and how best to address them. There are obviously no easy answers. Change is required on many fronts as this Congress is exploring, but we know that future focused design is one element that's required because it's a powerful tool for change. I'm James Kelly, Seniors Living and Care Partner at Clark Hopkins Clark Architects. I wanted to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the country I'm speaking to you from today, and pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders past, present and emerging. I'm speaking to you today from a slightly less restricted Melbourne, but acknowledge many people around the country will have been watching this having spent a significant amount of time in lockdown during 2020. As a small but important gesture, I wanted to film this session outside as a way of repositioning our thoughts away from the negativity that has consumed many aspects of our lives and talk about hope and community. So welcome everyone to my front yard. Today we'll go beyond the usual project overview format with a visual how-to session that explains a bit about how the design process works, draws on a range of projects from different contexts, explores the role of storytelling in design and how it's driven by genuine stakeholder engagement and how progressive design helps create vibrant integrated communities that embrace residents diversity, defy age of stereotypes, embed community connections and create a strong sense of place. Good design can be a driver for positive change. Positive stories about seniors communities can literally be shaped by their people and place. As architects, we look at design as a form of storytelling, and in doing so, hope to capture the essence of people, place, and character in everything we do. To expand, today I want to discuss four key elements to the role of story in design. Firstly, connection. Storytelling is absolutely fundamental to human experience, understanding, and connection. In design terms, if we don't connect and engage with a place, make memories in it through events, group activities, or little personal rituals, we simply pass through and forget it. As designers, we can create a variety of spaces that draw people in, make them want to linger and give them agency to use in different ways as they see fit. That's when we see residents spontaneously start to express their own creativity and tell their own stories through the way they use the spaces provided. If the physical environment is too prescriptive or too generic, it stifles this individuality and personality and freedom of expression which is precisely what makes a community engaging and distinctive. Identity. This is about understanding the client, the organisation and the brand. Why should someone choose this facility? What is the unique element to it? What is the thing that's going to make this a landmark destination? What are the things that people love, hate or want? Form. Good design uses scale and form to differentiate public, semi-private and private space. The design narrative unpacks and explores unique identity and connection to people and place. Buildings that can be read and understood become places people like to dwell and engage. And good design understands that the mix of uses required and provides a variety of appropriately scaled spaces that connect seamlessly with one another. Last, but certainly not least, is the idea of context. And neighborhood is central to this. Built form should reflect local place, history, and character. To start, I would like to talk about connection. Stories are the lifeblood of connection. They allow us to empathize, to learn and to celebrate. They form the basis of memory and are so important as we age. As designers, we have a role to play in the creation of stories. The places and spaces we design help foster engagement and life, and with that, often wonderful stories. Today, I will be sharing two stories of residents at facilities we've recently designed. I hope these show the impact of design strategies on a resident's sense of engagement and connection to the home they are living in. This is Terry. Terry's a green thumb from Queensland who created a spectacular edible garden with herbs, fruit and veggies at Estia Health on the Sunshine Coast. He now supplies some of his produce to the catering team for use in resident meals. 
The facility has been designed with a designated sensory and resident garden space. This wonderful area has supported resident choice as to the activities they wish to undertake. In Terry's case, his pet project is the veggie garden, which is thriving. The outcome of Terry's fantastic work is shared meals eaten in a variety of settings throughout the facility. This allows everyone to connect with each other. The outdoor environment plays a significant role and they can all enjoy the spoils of the edible garden produce. I question whether these shared experiences would have occurred without these designed elements. I would also like to introduce you to Maria. She is a keen artist from Laylor in Victoria who runs something of a small business at Wattle Grove drawing portraits for fellow residents. Whilst on the side, she also enjoys undertaking a form of tarot card reading, which you can see in this photo. However, I've been told from staff to be a bit wary of the future she tells. Maria is enabled by the design of the facility to undertake her passion projects through the provision of community and art spaces within the central street of the facility. This active heart comes alive every day as residents come out of their residential households to engage with a range of activities and social events. By centralising these activities, it gives residents choice as to whether or not they would like to join in on any given day, whilst also providing activation through the middle of the building, helping to bring the whole facility to life. This fosters relationships and friendships between residents and staff. One group of like-minded residents have created a walking group and they take off every day to visit all the sites within the facility. As you can see here, the receptionist gets a morning hello from everyone as they walk past. Whilst a sense of community and connection can be developed almost anywhere, the simple addition of spaces designed for community use at Wattle Grove has helped foster these friendships. What good design can do is encapsulate the identity of clients, their residents and their neighbourhood context and create diverse spaces that are genuinely connected to people with each other. Their passions, their stories and their broader community become really relevant. And the best way to do this is through really meaningful engagement with a broad mix of stakeholders. One of our company values is listen first. This is to make sure we truly understand our clients and users needs before responding in design terms. This is an approach that permeates all the conversations we have during the design process and is particularly relevant early on in the development of a brief and concept. Stakeholder engagement as we know it should be a mechanism to do two things in my opinion. Firstly, it should bring staff, residents and communities along the journey of design. It should also ensure that the design defies stereotypes and truly reflects diverse people's rituals, relationships and lifestyles. This forms the unique identity of any design and should be tailored to the resident, staff, community and organisational hopes and desires. Stakeholder engagement is not a linear process, nor a finite one. It is something that should constantly evolve as a project develops. One of the starting points to any conversation is often with the staff, executive team or development team. This is the point where a project is conceived, often setting the parameters for future design work. We always find it best to engage staff in physical and hands-on interpretation of briefing requirements. This image is one such example, where we are using lifting equipment to test a prototype of a bedroom to understand the desired joinery's impact on circulation and functionality of the room. Another great way to engage with staff is to undertake shared site tours of facilities that may be similar in nature. This process ensures all can easily understand the design decisions being made and lessons learnt from previously completed projects. I would highly recommend this shared form of learning with any design process. We cannot of course forget the residents within a discussion around a design project. Some of the best ideas come from those living and enjoying buildings, spaces and places. We particularly loved undertaking design idea sessions with residents. Although I must admit that some of the design ideas can be very, very difficult to achieve. These sessions generally take the form of open-ended questions based on things like, what do you like? What don't you like? What would you love to have? Some of the simple pleasures in life can be enshrined and maintained through this process. It allows us to get rid of things that aren't working and be aspirational all at the same time. Of course, with any design, there should be a connection with the wider community. A stakeholder process should not forget this. We should be looking to actively engage with local community groups, volunteer organisations and your neighbours. 
This example is one of a community open day, where residents are simply invited to come and engage with plans for their new facility. We are there to answer questions, and it becomes a great way to hear from a diverse group of people and their connection to the place in which you are designing. Architecture is a visual profession. We often get too caught up in appearance and function. We are promoting today the use of design as a way of expressing story, to facilitate story creation. We feel it is a way to develop deeper connection with each other, especially for our older Australians, and therefore it helps fight against ageist attitudes and other community sentiments that tear us apart rather than bring us together. We should be using innovative design as a positive force for change, and storytelling is central to great design in our opinion. As part of my presentation today, I would like to show a couple of examples of the use of the design narrative to improve connection to place and community. These short stories, I hope, show the relatively simple way you can design for people and their connection to place. By listening first, you are able to come to a joint understanding of what is important to people. What makes them who they are and what are their day-to-day -day pleasures? This allows us to embed a depth of thinking into the design process creating a holistic design approach that allows for dynamic, site-responsive, integrated communities within communities. The first example is the Bays, which is located in a suburban area of Hastings, Victoria. It is a town that has a strong connection to Western Port Bay and enjoys wonderful views out to the Bay itself. When we were asked to design a new residential aged care facility and community health precinct for the Bays Healthcare Group, we looked at the local area as the basis for conversations regarding the building's appearance and its connection to the town itself. This became a study of the local industry, the sea and the area between, being the tidal wetlands area. These three elements then became the focus of the design concept of striations, which evolved into two parts. A conversation about colour and tone based around the natural environment, and a way of clearly identifying architectural elements and explaining design intent through things such as the sculptural gesture tying back to industry, the natural rhythms of the residential wings, and the boardwalk identity as a way of bringing the wetlands element into the building in a subtle manner. As the building's form developed, you can see the inclusion of these elements into a preliminary design outcome. We are looking to celebrate the entry and the public zone with the gable end clad in metal cladding from the nearby factories, to soften the entry through the use of timber look elements, and to provide a consistent tonal response to the residential wings that picks up on the coloration of, and the movement in the sands of the wetlands. One of the special features for this facility came about from a chance interaction we had during the design process. The existing residents of the facility love to sit out under a covered veranda near the entry to watch the day go by. So much so that they would be all lined up in the morning and would welcome everyone as they entered the facility. We felt we had to celebrate this and give residents the ability to continue this tradition. One such space set aside for this is a fantastic viewing room on the upper level. Whilst it has views out over Western Port, it also allows for residents to sit inside or outside to watch the comings and goings at the local school and to the front door of the facility. We hope that the residents are loving this space, um, which was conceived from a much loved ritual. My second example today is the Wattle Grove Aged Care Facility in Laylor, Victoria, which is an ethnically diverse area of Melbourne. The focus for this project was very much on the internal environment and the ability for interiors to convey a sense of understanding and cultural cues. As such, the design narrative used the idea of extending an olive branch to bring people together from different backgrounds, faiths and views in a facility suitable for them all. It became evident through some of our demographic analysis and potential resident research that there was likely to be a large resident population with backgrounds from Eastern European countries such as Greece, Macedonia and Croatia. This informed how the design evolved. As you can see in the images that set the tone for the facility, the cultural design cues we were looking to activate were around the following themes of pattern, colour, tone and texture. This process was about celebrating the identity of a yet unknown resident population that was likely to call the place home. We looked at a palette that was almost a kaleidoscope of these themes. When we think of European settings, we think of almost a riot of visual and textual elements, and we really wanted to provide for that in an appropriate way to enhance residents' comfort in the spaces they were to call home. The provision of pops of colour, detailed elements of patterning including in tiles and wallpaper, 
textural changes in stones and fabrics, and the combination of these became central to the design story. In this open server image, you can see the use of pattern in the splashback, with differing patterning and types and colour used in the servers of different households to help orientate you to your location. The open and shared nature of the servery, which connected with a winter garden area to allow for outdoor dining, particularly suited the shared food experience of the resident demographic and has become a favourite place in the facility for residents to share. Whilst the design narrative is one way to connect with the identity and stories of residents, staff and visitors alike, it can often not be readily accessible to the wider community. We feel this is a final critical piece to the puzzle of designing for connection. Creating vibrant communities is a philosophy that Clark Hopkins Clark has been promoting over a number of years. It grew out of a practice mission to impact tomorrow and our commitment to social, environmental and financial sustainability. I thought it was particularly relevant to share the basis for this methodology today, especially as we are talking about the topic of context and to show an example of how this can be put into practice. At Clark Hopkins Clark, we value the contribution that design can make to the creation of vibrant communities. So much so that one of my partners, Dean Landy, wrote a book on that particular subject. The book itself contains a number of case study examples of best practice urban design outcomes with some of Australia and the world's leading designers and developers. It is also a how-to guide with some core principles that can be applied to design generally. Whilst I can highly recommend grabbing a copy of the book and having a read, I thought today I'd give you a sneak peek into some of these principles. As a practice, we have refined the methodology contained in the book to a bespoke tool to allow us to analyse and create projects that have a higher value than the sum of their parts. This image is a representation of the elements we look to include or respond to within any development, and these can be scaled from the smallest project to the largest. Broadly, these are categorised into hard and soft elements. Hard elements are the tangible ones. These are the uses and mix of uses that start to deliver a sense of vibrancy in place. Think community, retail, health. The soft elements, on the other hand, are the intangibles. These are the things that give someone comfort, a sense of identity, or a sense of intrigue. Think place, connection, safety. Now, today I would like to show you how this can translate to a design outcome using a project on the drawing board in our office. This project is a seniors living in aged care community located on an old school site in Keelor in Melbourne's northwest. To start any conversation about creating vibrant communities, we need to understand the vibrancy of the community to which our design intervention will be added. That is the point of this diagram. It is an analysis of the hard elements related to the site, and whilst you can see there is a town centre some distance from the site, there really isn't anything meeting the needs of the community in the area the site is located, aside from a community park. This then helps guide a conversation about the brief, and how through design we can add to the community connection on site. Something that will be critical to a community who is used to the site being a community asset as a school, and accessible to all. Starting with the soft elements and connection, we know as part of our analysis that we have a community asset to the east of the site, being the community park. This becomes a core component of the design as we look to provide community connections through fitness trails, walking paths and covered ways to the park itself. As an ungated community, we are effectively inviting the community to engage with our site as they make their way to the council park. Finally, and briefly, I wanted to touch on the hard elements. These are the provision of a mix of uses to allow for the differing levels of community interaction. As was found in our analysis, there was a shortage of uses in the surrounding area and the brief for this site has evolved to try and capture as many elements of our ideal mix as possible. We have provided dwellings, public realm improvements including recreation spaces, healthcare and the provision of high care aged care, community assets and retail uses. It is our hope that as this site develops, the community created as well as the existing community will come to thrive in the spaces and places created on the site. That is all I have for you today. I trust you have gained some understanding of the design process and some of the tricks we try and use to get the best out of each and every project. I want to remind you that storytelling unites us and the best stories draw us in with their character, detail and location, something we recognise as distinctive and true. It is vitally important for developers operating at scale at state and national level to remember the people and community you are designing for in each and every case. Local knowledge and character input creates a much better result and a positive, compelling story to share. So thanks for listening. 
please feel free to get in contact either through the meeting hub or directly through my contact details on the screen. Thank you.